Thank you, Beth, for the selection of that song as and for printing the words in the bulletin. If you want to understand what restorative justice is, that, that song explains it very well, and thank you, choir. It is truly a, a privilege to stand in this pulpit, although I feel inadequate to stand here after uh, Pastor Elizabeth has been here for so many years. What a, what a masterful preacher she is, and uh, what a grace it was in my life, and my wife's life, to be able to come and be under her ministry here grateful to her for offering us a place for Three Rivers Restorative Justice to uh, have an office and to work out of, and for this church's awareness of the need for reaching out and justice into our community. You know, sometimes even when we speak the same language, uh, and by the way, Odile, you did a wonderful job with uh, reading in, in uh, what is not your first language, beautiful, beautiful message. But sometimes even when we speak the same language, our words get misunderstood and, and we need an explanation. The words out of the scripture that we're going to hear today is, uh, it shows us that Jesus even had to explain to people of his own culture, of his own village, what he was saying. And it reminded me of a humorous situation that happened back when I was training for the, uh, we were living in Kansas City, I was training for the Kansas City Marathon, which that runs right by the Kansas City bus station, and I've been training on that course. And uh, one evening I went to the uh, Kansas City bus station to meet a gentleman who had just, like an hour or so before, gotten out of Leavenworth Penitentiary, uh, Jesse. Some of you met him, he was here with me a couple years ago. And uh, he had some time before he had to catch the bus and leave for his halfway house, and so I said, hey Jesse, um, here's all the restaurants. I know that, you know, guys in prison think about their first meal when they get out. I said, you can go this, this, and this, and this place to go eat. They're all right around here. And he looked at me and he said, you know, how do you know this part of town so well? This is not really a part of town I would picture you uh, spending much time in. And I said, oh, I said, I, I run these streets. And uh, he got quiet and he looked at me and he said, I used to live in a place where the gangs ran the streets, and he said, you don't look like the Latin kings, he said, you don't look like the Crips, you wear a suit and you're white, he said, are you in the mafia? And I said, no, I don't, um, but we had a good laugh about that, but uh, Jesus had to sometimes explain what he had to say, and so here are the words uh, out of Mark chapter 4, and we'll try to break out to understand what he was really saying. What else is the kingdom of God like? What earthly thing can we compare it to? The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, the tiniest seed you can sow. After that seed is planted, it grows into the largest plant in the garden, a plant so big that the birds of the air can make their nest in it. Jesus spoke in many parables like these to the people who followed him. This was the only way that he taught them. Although when he was alone with his chosen few, he interpreted the stories so the disciples could truly understand what he was saying. What Jesus is wanting us to understand, what he was speaking of in this parable, is that the, the kingdom of God, which I prefer to call the reign or the rule of God, that it can flourish and it can grow like a, a tiniest of seeds into a 20-foot tree and that this little seed is what is born in each one of us when we are born, that sense that we come into this world in a sense of connection, being rooted and connected to others. And when we grow, we grow in that sense of oneness. Jesus' prayer, his prayer for all of us is that we would be one. And so the growth of that tree is a growth in the sense of oneness, into a sense of unity, a sense of kinship with every person, no exceptions. Unity, not uniformity. That everyone, especially the lepers of our day, those who are on the margin, that they would feel at home with you and me as we grow in that sense of oneness. I would suggest as uh, Mother Teresa said, that the problem with our world today is that we have forgotten that we belong to each other. Greg Boyle, who is the founder of Homeboy Industries, uh, a father that uh, has dedicated his ministry to the gangs of uh, Los Angeles, asked this question, how do we create compassion? And then imagine no one can stand outside of that circle. 
and then move to the edge of the circle and stand with those whose dignity has been denied, those who have been marginalized, those whose burdens are more than they can bear. Occasionally, you get very fortunate and are able to stand with those who are easily despised and readily left out, stand with the demonized so that the demonizing can stop, with the disposable so that one day we will stop throwing people away. If we had kinship, if we had kinship, we would not be promoting justice, Father Boyle says. We would be celebrating justice. No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no peace. For the past 23 years, it's been my privilege to walk alongside men who have spent time in federal prison, and they have taught me everything of value, really. When I first went in, I thought I came in with something to teach them, but I realized they had so much more to teach me. How can we achieve this kind of compassion that stands in awe of the poor and the imprisoned instead of in judgment over how they handle their situation? How can we stand in awe of those who are poor and imprisoned instead of in judgment over how they carry it? I had the chance to meet Father Greg Boyle and the, uh, the, the gang members and the others that he worked with often come to him and tell him how much they appreciate them and love them. And he'll just shrug his shoulders and say, it's mutual. It's mutual. There is an idea, unfortunately, that has taken root in the world and that is at the heart of all that is wrong in our world. And this is the idea that some lives are not worth as much as other lives. How do we stand against that idea? When I was first started in the restorative justice program in the United States Penitentiary Leavenworth, I walked into that dark place and I saw the most segregated, the most divisive place I had ever been. It made the Deep South look like uh, uh, a hippie commune of love and, and peace compared to what it was like inside of, of Leavenworth. If you wanted to go into the chow hall to eat, you had to have a gang to belong to or you couldn't sit down. Uh, you had to hold your tray or you had to just eat what you could find out of the commissary. Uh, they were, it was the men themselves determined that nobody could have a cellmate who was not of their own race. If you committed a certain type of a crime and you were in that place, your life was not worth a nickel. It was a violent, it was a divided place. Into that place of, of, of division, we had the chance to bring the message of Christ, message of oneness, the message that we heard the choir sing about, about forgiveness. And we began to bring in people who had been victims of crime, to speak to people who had caused those crimes and see those barriers walk down, see guys with tears streaming down their eyes that I never thought about with the effect that I had on other people. We brought in mentors. Mentors sometimes who oh, uh, had come from the similar types of backgrounds and sometimes from very different backgrounds to work with the men. I remember a man by the name of Manny Zavala who came up in the streets of, of Los Angeles, a gang leader for the Vice Lords there. And uh, all tattooed, head to, uh, heels uh, tattooed, but wanting to change his life, wanting to find something different. We found a mentor for him. Uh, I mean, this mentor's name was Lamar Hunt. And if you know the NFL, you know that name, Lamar Hunt was the owner of the Kansas City Chiefs. This was Lamar Hunt Jr. was his son, but still owner of the Kansas City Chiefs. So you had a, a, a multimillionaire, if not billionaire, owner of the Kansas City Chiefs who was sitting every uh, week for hour or more face to face, knee to knee with Manny Zavala, the leader of the Vice Lords. And those guys came to love each other. They came to hear about each other's kids. And Manny came to find out that growing up as the son of an NFL owner was not an easy thing and Lamar came to understand that growing up on the streets of Los Angeles what that was like and they had a true sense of love and companionship with one another and I remember Lamar was there when Manny graduated and with tears in his eyes hugged him and saw him head out and go back and, and uh, Manny is still doing well today is uh, moved from LA his father has a, works as a mechanic and is doing great but it was that connection that restoration that happened in his life and if God can do that, if he can take an NFL owner and put them beside a leader of, of the vice lords and bring them to one and appreciation for each other, 
And I believe that that seed can grow in all of us and can spread like a, uh, a tree and a groom. One more story, and then I'm going to let Dondi share his story. Little Bobby Nelson was not little. Little Bobby Nelson was a motorcycle gang leader from Missouri. He uh, 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 had a hatred in his heart, particularly for people of color, particularly for Jews. He had his knuckles tattooed, so it said, pure, with a letter on each uh, uh, knuckle, pure hate, uh, when he came into Leavenworth. And he uh, saw everyone else as a rival, as a competitor, as outside of his group. He had a very small little group who were in his gang were the only people that he had any compassion for. But you know, it's hard to keep that kind of hate up. And he saw what was happening in our program. And he said, you know, I'm tired of being tired. And I'm tired of hating. And he came over. And we found him a job as a photographer to take pictures of our graduations and other events. And he got to know the guys. And he got to know a guy by the name of Ernest Terry, a big man of color, as big as him, from Indianapolis. They'd been in rival types of gangs before but they became best friends. And uh, little Bobby has been out now for a number of years, and I saw him just before COVID, I saw him down in Kansas City at a gathering that we had, and there he was hanging out with former rival uh, gang uh, leaders from St. Louis, men of color, and hanging out and being in companionship with them. We can grow in oneness. We can grow into uh, uh, that tree of, that God wants us to flourish into. It shouldn't surprise us that God's own dream for us, that we would be one, also happens to be our own deepest longing. For you see, it is mutual. It is mutual. Privilege to uh, have a gentleman come up and share a story. Don D. McIntosh was one of the most active guys in the chapel at the Federal Medical Center working with uh, men of all different groups. And he's going to share with you a moment of how God also is flourishing in his life in the spirit of oneness. Don D. Go. Good morning, church. Man, this is a beautiful situation. I was gone for 15 years, and I'm, honestly, I'm really uh, excited to even speak on this, you know, because God's power and love is extremely amazing. The things that it can conquer and work its way in, in situations that you would just never think is possible. And listening to him, as I call him all the time, my big brother, because that's the relationship, that kinship, that empathy, that sympathy that, that, that developed by going through some of the things that I've been through. Just speaking on a little bit on the hard times as far as uh, the things that I've been through, I started off in a, a higher security in Pekin, Illinois. But I've seen a lot of things and a lot, a lot of violence uh, that you would think there's just, there's no way that you can have someone care or even love the way I originally, eventually found out throughout my transition as far as doing what I was supposed to, getting involved in, in things that are positive, and let alone getting to know my faith and my relationship with my God and my Creator. And working my way down and seeing the things that I've seen, because um, honestly, to see circumstances where men are fighting in, in anger and, and hate and everything that Kendall spoke about, you just wouldn't believe how working through those circumstances and, and going to church and doing the things that you're supposed to and working your way down to a lower security, which one of the beautiful things about Rochester. I did 12 years in the facility here at Rochester. Coming from out of that circumstance where it was so volatile and then being in a situation where I'm being taken from a bus ride because a previous conversation from a friend of mine that just happened to say, well, this is where I'm going, big brother. If you, you know, if you end up finding your way down that way when your points drop, because that's what happens when you've been in higher security so long and doing what you're supposed to do, as far as accolades of school and religion and things of that hierarchy. Um, so when I found myself at that point of time in life and praying like, Lord, you got to get me out of this situation. <laughs> To be somewhere like Rochester, FMC, it blew my mind. Because the, where I come from, being an individual alley and a division that, that is really uh, prominent within those circumstances, you just, not, you just couldn't believe that I would be somewhere where 
you would feel the presence and the hand of God so deeply to the point when I got off the bus, <laughs> still it, it kind of floors me because I just couldn't believe it. The trees, the birds, and just the conversation of people going into the facility. And I remember going and, and I'm running because we, we have cars, as what we call it, to what, if you belong to this part of the United States or this part of the United States, that's you find your people, it's just survival. So to come somewhere like Rochester and I'm walking the compound and I'm on my way to go eat and I'm going into the facility to go eat and I'm looking around and for the first time, my eyes get really big. And the young man that's behind me, he's like, he kind of chuckled and laughed. He's like, it's not like that here. I kind of did a step back, like, what do you mean? Now, mind me, when I look out into the crowd, because as, as he says, it's very segregated. It's for safety, it's for security, it's for life. To be a part of something like that and see that, that everybody, every culture, every background of a faith, every mob or whatever else you want to add to that, a communion, eating, speaking, and getting along. Now, that was my first sign. I came across a friend of mine and he invited me to service and a movie, because that's really big there too. So I, I, as I'm at this particular movie and I'm seeing the multitude that's in the crowd, I mean, you have every culture, every background where normally where things like this, it can just end so badly. So when my mentor that's no longer with me, God bless you, um, Andrew, and he's up there and he's talking about this is a Christian-based program and we're gonna show a movie. And in my headspace, I'm like, okay, I need to get safe. But once the lights went out and they showed the Christian movie, it shocked me how everyone got along. Couldn't believe it. So to go to service in church the next day and hear the message and see the camaraderie amongst the empathy and, and the role playing of, of people that are involved, like the staff and, and men like Kendall that come in and give that love, because that's what it comes down to, honestly. When we are able to not, not sympathize, but empathize and know that there is no division between me or you, we are all the same, it changed me. It made me strive to be better. It made me want to be more of and understanding because of scripture and being in the word to know that I'm no longer the man that I used to be, but I'm a new creature in Christ. And that's a beautiful thing to see that transition and have the volunteers come in and not, not treat you as a yesterday's trash, but God's creation and the realization that there is no the division between me and you, but there's love. Honestly, I can go on and on, but I just wanted to just, you know, and I am very thankful to be able just to just get up here and speak, which is, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, man, that kinship that he talks about, I thank God that that blessing, that miracle is consistently possible because to be able to be embraced and know that I'm no longer the 1047026, <laughs> but Donnie D. Carlos McIntosh, Christian, it's a blessing. So with that being said, thank you.